All right. Very good. Very good. Well, we're like a Swiss clock, so let's uh, let's begin. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, Dr. Brown is going to be talking about his latest book called uh, Legacy of the Master. And uh, after he finishes talking about a chapter called The Rules of Thumb, we're going to give uh, four trainers of ours and a uh, little trainer that's coming, the, the daughter of Pedro, a chance to have uh, their question asked to Dr. Bandler. All right. So please, everybody, mute it. And remember that you're going to get the recording of today. We also have this same uh, um, webinar in the morning. So you're going to have basically five recordings with a lot of questions answered from Dr. Bandler. They're going to be uh, uploaded in his YouTube account. So you can watch them over and over and over again. So let's give the spotlight to Shiny. Hello. She's still muted. Yeah, uh, unmute yourself, Shiny. Okay, there you go. I needed you to unmute me. So hello, everybody. And my question to Dr. Bandler is about the beliefs. As we know, NLP is one of the biggest and most amazing tools to change our beliefs. And my question is, what is the fastest and the most long-lasting way to change our beliefs by using NLP tools, Dr. Bandler? Well, that's going to depend upon the person to a certain degree. That's also what makes something about NLP is if you find out what people's strongest belief is, find out where it is, how big it is, all of those kinds of things, that will tell you how to construct a belief and how to switch it in. A swish pattern is probably the most powerful way to build a belief, but it isn't just the picture, which is the mistake that a lot of people make. You have to get the feelings to switch direction at exactly the same time so that they don't just move a picture from here to there. They spin the feeling up, and as the feeling becomes incredibly powerful, poof, they move the picture up. That your ability to build functional beliefs uh, I think is one of the evolutionary tools that NLP has given the world. Uh, that to me, I found out very early on, because uh, psychologists kept talking about belief systems. And being a mathematician, I couldn't find anything systematic about it at all, to tell you the truth. It was just a huge nominalization. And so I started asking people, how do you know you believe this? And of course, you got the accessing cues, the location, the distance, the size, you know, and and then and I'd ask, you know, I go, well, now that you have this picture, how do you know you believe it? And people literally would make telephone postures in those days because telephones were huge. You know, it's you don't see it so much anymore. But people would go and talk to themselves like they were making a telephone call and make gestures with their hands, you know, and they they'd go, well, you know, there's a certain point. It's like the point, there's a point at which a belief is something that you kind of have and where then it becomes a conviction. And to me, if you want it to last for a long time, you have to get it to become a conviction. They have to be so convinced of it that it's unshakable. Um, to me, this, you know, this is what happens because otherwise it fades away after time, you know, or circumstances can deconstruct it. You know, that people, you know, really believe they want to buy something and then a bunch of people tell them stuff and suddenly they don't want to buy it anymore. That's not really a belief. It's not certainly a strong belief. And it's absolutely not a conviction that to me, when I'm testing for beliefs, I find things that are absolutely that people are certain of. You know, the idea that breathing is good really isn't something that people question. You know, and put a plastic bag over your head and think about it. Uh, it's, you know, it's a complete conviction. You know, when it comes, you know, do you want your children to be alive? People have no doubt about that, except now and then. But that's usually more metaphoric. Uh, that 
people have really strongly con conviction. And if you just pick any old belief and swish it in there, uh, it's not strong enough. You want it to last for a long time. You have to pick something incredibly powerful that has been there and will be there for a long time. All right. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. We have now Yurina. Please Hi, Yurina. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, Richard. I'm very happy to see, see you again. And now, so in the three years, we are now experiencing enormous transition time. And I believe NLP is really great resource for us. And I'm always grateful for what you have done for us. Well, I keep track of you. I sign your certificates, you know, I can <laughs> see how much you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, many trainers uh, enjoying and students are happy to learn NLP. Yeah. And the question is, people often ask, what is my life purpose or what is my mission? And how do you answer if somebody asks that? Well, uh, I was actually asked this earlier. And when people say, what's my purpose? Uh, your purpose is, is, is to live your life and to get things done and to manifest. If there isn't anything that you want strongly, you have no purpose. You need to be able to make an image in which you see yourself and look at it and feel desire. So if you have a realistic image of who you are now, you know, a lot of people said you have to accept yourself I'm not a big fan of that philosophy. I think that when you look at yourself, you should be able to ask that you should be thinking work in progress. What next? And, you know, and the people that are the happiest that my clients, because when I wrote the book, The Secrets of Being Happy, I explored the difference between people that went through the same experience, roughly. And some of them came out happy and functional, and some of them came out just reliving the past and doing badly. And one of the big differences is, is they had a plan that you know, people in concentration camps were thinking about what they were going to do when they got out of it. People that were in prison were thinking about what they wanted to do when they got out, so they didn't end up going back. And for the rest of us that aren't in prison or a concentration camp, we should think that our life right now in certain ways, it's, it's, it's living inside of a box. And then the question is, how do I want to make my box better? Right? Uh, you know, and if you can have slightly unrealistic goals, right? You know, that I, I talked yesterday to a bunch of uh, millionaires that are on the same website. And one of them said, you know, he said, what should my purpose be? And I said, well, your purpose should be to get your business to be bigger, but you should set the thing that you want to do it in half the time. You want to work half as much and get four times as much income. And that when you set the, set it up that way, instead of trying to work harder to make more, you, you end up doing it intelligently. You make a plan that gets you to work less and get more. And this means that all that extra time, if you do work, then you'll get even that richer. And to get things done, uh, people feel good when they accomplish stuff. That, you know, when I meet people that have farms and they get done planting, you know, all of this stuff or tilling the fields, task by task, every time they start, they start out, they have an idea of what they're gonna do and they know this is done. And then they ask the question, what's next? And to me, the purpose is to be the kind of person, you know, who isn't finished, the kind of person who isn't necessarily satisfied, because it's satisfied sounds over. You want to have a satisfying life. You want to have a happy isn't a place. It's not a thing. Hap happily is an adverb. You want to happily be living your life and getting things done and accomplishing things. And that's going to be different for everybody. When somebody asks me what their purpose is, the, the truth is, I don't know, nor do I really care. 
you know, that's they need to make decisions about that. They need to have a strategy that looks into the future and sees themselves better than they are now and go, I want to be that person. And they want to be it stronger than any obstacle. They have to be relentlessly optimistic, right? And relentlessly determined. Those two are a very powerful combination. And that's my goal with every client I work with. Too much is not enough. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bandler. You we bet. Next, Alexander. You're back again. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, good afternoon, I guess. It's here in Australia. It's 8.30 uh, in the morning or something like that. Yeah, and it's four four ten in the afternoon here, so yeah, it's yeah, got to be four. It's got to it's it's got to be something other than yeah. eight thirty. <laughs> it's got to be eight forty or something. Yeah, it's uh, eight forty here. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. See, I'm a mathematician. I can figure these things out. Absolutely, and uh, we managed to have a few people from Australia as well. And uh, some of the questions uh, I managed to that I managed to receive, and I'm kind of uh, summarized in on, into one question. I remember um, hearing you saying something like that: the biggest limitation is not what we can or we can't do, but is what we never thought of doing yet or something like well, that there, there there are four possibilities if you think about it there's something you want that you don't have right S something that you have that you don't want something that you want and you have it or there's things that you don't want and don't have mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's the biggest one because some of those are more worth wanting than you would ever expect and this falls in the, the thing uh, to me, when I first work with a client, I have certain rules of thumb that I follow. And one of those is I try to figure out what's in their model and what's outside their model. And so if I have somebody that comes in and they go, I keep ending up with the wrong guy. Well, that tells me they don't have something that's looking in the right place. Their idea of what a good guy is is the wrong model to have in the first place because they keep ending up with some guy that's a pig and a shit. And uh, that, you know, to me, that a lot of them come to me and they go, what's wrong with me? And the, the question isn't, what's wrong with you? The question is, how can I attract the right kind of person? How do I have to change myself so I end up with the right guy? Because you'll never even find out what the right guy is until you become the kind of person that would that the right guy would want want and you know the same thing is true about men and women and and lots of other things in the universe that if you don't become the kind of person people tell me they're not artistic they're not mathematical they're you know they're not musical I, they're not they can't you know they're not they're not coordinated uh, the list goes on and on. Their map has told them that they're a kind of person. So therefore, they don't explore those things. Hundreds and hundreds of times I've taken somebody in front of an audience that tells me they're not artistic. And 20 minutes later, they're showing a painting to an audience, which is applauding uh, that, you know, I've done this over and over again. I get people who are not musical to be blowing saxophone solos and uh, that... It, it, because when people go into hypnotic trances, one of the first things that happens is they lose a lot of their inhibitions. So they try things that they wouldn't try when they're in the waking state. Because if you consciously believe, and you know the, the word lie is in the middle of believe. Uh, <laughs> if you believe that you're the kind of person that can't do something, well, listen to the sentence. You can that is, have the ability to not do it. But that doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to do it. It just means that you've cut your model of the world down so that you're not mapping new territory or what I like to call territorizing. The person who territorizes goes off whenever something seems impossible and says, okay, that's what I'm going to do because the biggest challenge has the biggest reward. All right. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much. Yeah.
Now we have somebody from New York that trained uh, in the 90s. Jeffrey. All right. Jeffrey hey. Noble. Hey, Jeff. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. Hey, <laughs> Way too long. <laughs> I promise I'll get out there very, very shortly. To see. How have you been? Good? I've been good. Yes, Mrs. What says nineteen? I'll be better than better than I deserve, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had um, one question that I want to ask you. There are a number of ones I could ask you, but I'm going to ask you one right now. If someone just started with NLP now, they're just getting started with NLP. What if, how would the advice you gave us back then be different than what you would tell them nowadays? Well, to start with, I don't even remember the advice I gave you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what advice did I give you? Just go out there and do it. Oh, Just don't you know, the advice hasn't out. changed at all. <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, it, it, see, to me, you either learn about things or you learn to do things. Mm -hmm. and part of the trouble with online trainings is you learn all about it, but it doesn't mean you can do it. Uh, right. There are many things you can watch online that doesn't mean you're able to do them, let alone do them well. NLP has got a lot of parts to it, and there are a lot of things. You have to practice the meta model upside down, backwards, and inside out to get really good at it. And you have to keep in mind what, what the purpose of asking questions is. When I work with advanced right. systems planning at an electronics company, it's really different than when I work with a depressive. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the same meta model. It's a problem-solving machine, but you have to be able to use it. And if, you know, you have to have the right tone of voice when you ask a question, even the right gestures and facial expressions, every nuance counts from what you see from your clients as much as what you project out of yourself. And, you know, you could read can you, about Can you repeat that again? Can you repeat that again? I have like, I have like 25 students on. So can you repeat that again for them? Every nuance of everything that comes out of you and everything that comes into your senses counts. It's what makes it, it makes the difference between being adequate and being superb. And, mm. and when you train with a person who has got the kind of experience that you have and these other trainers have, because I never was easy on any of you because Tell I wanted it. you <laughs> to be the best you could. <laughs> My job, my job wasn't to make learning NLP so that you 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 were satisfied too quickly. My job was to make you so that you always wanted to know what was next, how to do it better. That, you know, it's one thing to know the meta model. It's another to keep learning it and learning it and learning it. It took me years to get as good at it as I am. And I'm still learning. A lot of times people tell, ask me, they go, when are you going to learn another language? And I said, I've been learning another language my whole life. I just haven't mastered it yet. And my understanding of the techniques that I have developed over the years and the reason they keep changing and evolving is because I get better at it. I get better at reading what I'm looking at and projecting out every bit of nuance I can to get powerful responses so that I can change people in a way that will make them head in the right direction. I'm not just looking for an outcome. I'm looking for a new direction in somebody's life. And, you know, it's one thing to get them over a fear. It's another to take all that time they're going to save and head them in a new direction. Because if you just get rid of one problem, they'll stick another one in its place. And I want people to switch from being somebody that's ducking their whole life and avoiding things to becoming somebody with boundless optimism. And that requires good training and practice, 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 practice. All right. That was a very powerful statement about setting a new direction, not make, just making a change, but make, just setting a whole totally different direction in their lives. Well, think about it. If, if, if you're going along and you make the slightest tilt at an angle, two years later, you'll be this far apart. And so it takes a small change to redirect. So you have to be careful what direction you send people in, because otherwise, you know, you, 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 you quote, fix a problem and things get worse. 
one of the clients that came to me had belonged to another NLP quote unquote trainer. They weren't a licensed trainer like you guys, but they were a trainer. They had a certificate, which only told me they had a printer. And the person knew enough NLP that they got somebody to stop having anxiety, except they made their living as an artist and they motivated themselves to paint through anxiety. And so the, suddenly they, they were calm, but they couldn't work. They couldn't create, they couldn't do anything because he didn't give them new avenues to function. He just shut off the spigot. So they sat around and were calm. Uh, you know, they, the first thing they said is, is, I'm thinking of going into an ashram and meditating for the rest of my life. And I said, and then what? And they said, well, then I'll go into another life. And I went, and then what? You know, that, you know, you're never going to paint again. You know, you're not going to fall in love. You're not going to have children. You're not going to interact with the rest of the universe. You're going to go in a room where everybody agrees with everybody and hum together. I uh, said, uh, you know, so that's your plan. And they said, well, otherwise I would have to feel stress. And to me, stress isn't bad or good. It's a question of what direction you aim it at. And, you know, and whether or not it's stress that makes you feel good or stress that makes you feel hesitant, you know. And, and to me, in order to do a good job, you have to have a good understanding of where this direction you're sending somebody is going to take them. That you have to know enough because you've had enough experience with enough people to understand that everything has results and the results don't stop. They keep going. And you need to take the smallest change and use it as a convincer for people to head in the right direction. I'll take away your fear of heights, but I'm not going to make it so you jump off a building. All right. Thank you very much. Now we have a special guest, the daughter of uh, a trainer of ours, Petra. She has a question for you based on what um, she heard in this morning uh, session. So please unmute and speak loud, dear. Yeah, thank Remember, you dear, you're talking to an old person, so try to be as clear with each word as you can. Okay. My question is, is trauma real or are people just remembering their past and present? Is trauma real? Is that what you said? Uh, yeah, well, the trauma is real when it was happening. But if you're feeling bad about it uh, a year later and uh, you could either be reliving it or you can remember it. If you remember it, you see yourself in the memory and you go, boy, that was a terrible time. And you don't think about it that much. If you keep reliving it over and over again, then it makes things worse. And, in, and you feel like it's happening to you again and again and again. Uh, there are people that went out some, one night and somebody jumped on them and beat them up. And every time they'd start to leave their house, they feel like somebody's jumping on them and beating their house. So they never go anywhere. We call those people, and this is a big word, agoraphobics. Uh, and the tr those people, if they don't stop reliving it, right, and push it outside so they can see it as an event that's over, a lot of things are over. You know, when Christmas is over, it's over. You can remember it and be happy about what happened. But if you have a bad Christmas and people give you bad presents, you look at it and you go, well, that's over. But there's always the next Christmas to look forward to and birthdays and new people you can meet and wonderful things. See, the past is over, but the future, you get to do whatever you want for the rest of your life. And you get to have good ideas and do good things. And every once in a while, bad things will happen. There's a very famous guy named the Dalai Lama. I have a picture of him over my shoulder because I have his book there. And, uh, I liked something that he said so much. I tell people it all the time that bad things are like a pond and it's all calm and you throw a pebble in it and suddenly there are all these ripples. Well, eventually it calms down again. And that's what bad memories should be like. You should be upset at the time, but as time goes by, it should all settle down. And to me, most people who remember it the wrong way remember it in a way where they keep the pond rippling. 
They keep hitting the pond with their hand and going, it's it's not smooth. Hit it again and go, it's not smooth. And hit it again and go, it's not smooth. And we have a name for that in NLP. We call that stupid. All right. Thank you very much. Now we have a trainer uh, of ours. Please tell us, Jody, where you're at. Uh, actually, you're going to run your first practitioner, I believe. Very cool. You had a book. So, Jody. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Bandler. Great to see you again. Thank I have you. a question about. Yeah. What's your question? My question is how do you create awareness for someone who doesn't believe that they're the person that's causing the problem? I share this in saying I work with a lot of parents and teachers and coaches that want me to fix their kids or their students, and they have zero awareness that they're the one that's making the pattern. They're the one that has the programming that's creating this madness. So my question well, is, how do you create that awareness. If you, if you try to convince people that they're creating madness, I I started out. My first teacher was Virginia Satir, and she discovered early in her career as a social worker that if you took a schizophrenic and you put them in their family, they didn't look crazy. <laughs> right. And well, it, it made perfect sense. That's why she started doing family therapy. Now with me, when I had, you know, I, I, I used to work in schools and it was clear as a bell to me that the parents were creating the problem, that the kid wasn't a problem. It, his reactions were the natural reaction to it trying to convince the parent that the way they treated each other and him was a mistake, right? Uh, to me, I do just the opposite. I go, look, he's such a hard case. You're going to have to help me. And this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to pretend to be this way, pretend to be this way, and pretend to do this for a period of three or four months. If you're up to it, if you're not, if you're not functional enough to do this, I don't know if I can help your kid. And if you care about your child, uh, the name of this is called lying. And uh, sometimes you have to lie to people to get them to be smart enough to see what's going on. Because once they start pretending to do certain things and pretending to do certain things, as Milton said, you can pretend anything and master it. Thank you. I love that. All right, very good. And we have the last question comes from Soren. Uh, he's in Canada. Soren, he did the practitioner in July with us. There we go. Hi, Dr. Richard. Hi, was, Soren, how are was, you doing? Good, good, it was awesome to be there in July and get my practitioner mm -hmm. certificate. And I have a question about uh, pain control. I have a friend of mine that she has another friend and she says a lot of pain around here, unbearable and she's on medication. How can I do to help her to mitigate this pain, to have lower pain so she can live her life uh, normally most? Do you have any idea what causes the pain? She has some uh, muscle, something, three fingers away on the face. So she says, was well, something medical, but now she's fine, but the pain is still there. So when she takes the painkillers, does it go away? Yes, most okay. of the time. Pardon? Most of the time. Right. Well, have you heard of the technique called drug of choice? Yes. Okay. So... You should jump to that conclusion that if, see, it's not the drug that gets the pain to stop. The drug tells the body how to do it. And every sensation that she gets that you loop somebody through when you do drug of choice tells the body how to let go of the pain. Pain is usually caused by inflammation. That whatever, you know, that, you know, if somebody, you know, breaks their finger, Right. The inflammation is what causes the pain, not necessarily the break. The inflammation in the muscles around the finger and and at the little uh, tips of where the bone was broken, the nerves are just going wild. And, you know, like everything else, it needs an on off button. 
once they go into the state, I would hypnotize her and and I would take her into the state where she took the drug when it worked the best, have her relive it and get to the point where there's no pain and build an off button, right? And then go backwards through time to before she took the pain and make an on button so that she could turn it on anytime she wanted. Remember, control is everything. And, you know, if you go forward and backwards, you know, in time and in trance and get it to shut off, and then you can make it so that she can go back on her own. You could give her a, a reinduction signal. I like people when they, they do it to squeeze their own wrist and and the button to fire off and for them to go back into the state where pain doesn't. Uh, sometimes I move the pain from their jaw to their foot. Um, to show them that 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 this the brain is what's doing this. It's not the body. The body is sending a message, something is wrong. And if you're doing something to fix it, it doesn't need to send the message anymore. So as long as she's doing whatever she can do medically, and I would recommend she go to several doctors that are experts on this. Not every doctor knows how to fix everything, but there shouldn't be something that just keeps hurting that doesn't make sense and sometimes even with when people's arm is cut off their arm will hurt for years i've had somebody that was hit by a train and it took off their arm and you know 10 years later they come to me in a big group of practitioner course in uh, in london and there were you know literally hundreds and hundreds of people there and this guy asked me, he goes, he goes, I have to take so much drugs to kill the pain. He goes, I can't function. And I asked him, I said, when they give you painkillers, where do they put it? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, the arm that's not there hurts, right? So where are they giving you the shot? And he said, in the other arm. And I said, but that arm doesn't hurt, you know? So that tells me that he's getting a shot and psychologically shutting off the pain until the drugs wear off. I mean, that's ridiculous. So I had him start taking hallucinated shots and and, and eventually it stopped altogether. Uh, to me, you know, if you put your hand on her face and it's really tense and the muscles are tight and you, you do a little Feldenkrais work and loosen those muscles up, a lot of times the inflammation, once it stops, doesn't start again. So I'd learn a little Feldenkrais work along the way. That's why we have Edie around all the time. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bandler. And last, we have somebody from Brazil. A trainer from Brazil. Unmute yourself. Didn't I just Thank have you. a book come out in Portuguese? <laughs> Yes, we got patterns of problem solving in Portuguese that uh, master trainer Claudio Lara did a translation. It's already out there. We're going to send that that link also with uh, the, this video recording. Okay. Hello, Dr. Mandler. I'm Haissa. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having, for having me for, for the second time. <laughs> Um, you my for question. The second time, and that sounds yes. very suggestive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, what's the? My question is, what's the the what's the the, the strategies that we can use to help people dealing with with psychosomatic uh, conditions like arthritis? Well, arthritis isn't necessarily uh, psychosomatic. I know, but fibromyalgia, I don't know how to say in the in the in English, fibromyalgia in Portuguese. Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. Yes. Fibromyalgia. Yes. Fibromyalgia is epilepsy of the nervous system, basically. I know. That nerves are firing that don't need to. Uh, and to me, I, I've, I've found that when I take these people and put them into a deep trance, when people come in, I always think I have a scale of like 1,000 stre to stress and 1,000 to deep trance. And so you're either ultra relaxed 
And most people, when they're calm, instead of being at zero, they're somewhere around three, four or 500. So that they're, they're not, they're going, I, they'll literally look at you and go, I am relaxed, right? Which is very incongruent. And people with fibromyalgia, uh, their anxiety level has gotten to the point where it's triggering their nervous system off. So I have a tendency to put them into very, very deep states and leave them there for a while. Uh, and this is important because it takes a while to sink into the nervous system. Uh, I had one guy that came into a personal change workshop and he told me he was having this reaction to his fibromyalgia and it was firing off and his fingers were burning and and I kept nodding and listening to him. I did a handshake interrupt, dropped him into a super deep trance and had him relax more than he ever had in his entire life. And then I turned around 20 minutes later and said, that's not relaxed enough. You need to double it and double it and double it and double it again. He was like Gumby in the chair. I mean, he literally was just completely there and then turned around and started talking to the other people. I did so for an hour and people started to worry about it. People in the group started going, is he OK? And I went, yeah, this is the first time in his entire life that he's ever been completely relaxed. People need a reference structure. Then I had him come back to his waking state, but to bring the relaxation with him so that his nervous system, any time it began to fire off or he began to feel it, his nervous system, not his consciousness, but his nervous system would go back into that state because you want people to be able to go to zero. And as you reduce anxiety, that's good, but you have to reduce the chaos in the nervous system and mean, make it so that when you tap your finger, you feel your finger being tapped, not firing every nerve all over the place. You know, that's simply incorrect. And the unconscious can correct that. Set up finger signals, put somebody in charge, the unconscious. The conscious mind is not good at being in charge. It can't be trusted. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And thank uh, you very much. Yeah, and the last question they 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 send it to me because uh, they don't speak English, so eventually they'll get the subtitles. Um, they want to ask. Uh, this is the final question, by the way. They want to know well, the last is... one. <laughs> yeah, but we still have seven minutes. All right, I wouldn't <laughs> want to cheat you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, they want to know your strategy for tinnitus. Tinnitus. Those people that hear the buzz in their ear after they they took all the MRIs and the neurologist told them you're fine. The 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 <laughs> what you're that, hearing. That means is, I have is, no idea what to do. By the way, if you got ringing in your ears and nobody's helping you, I found two things that seem to work, and it depends upon the person. So I can't give you an absolute answer. One is, is I get people to tell me what note it is, uh, that whatever the ringing is, I'll literally sit down at the piano and, and hit notes until I can hit the one, you know, it's, you know, it's usually an octave or two above high C or low or middle C. And, you know, sometimes it's an A flat and sometimes it's an A and sometimes it's a B flat. I find out what note it is. And then I go up a major third. Uh, to that. So if it would be a C, then it would be an E on the piano. So it's not the next note, it's two notes, two notes away, but you, you have to skip a black key in between each one or a whole step, as they say on the piano. And I get them to learn internally to make the other noise so that instead of hearing one noise, they hear a harmony. And when they hear that harmony, if for some reason it seems to habituate and make the irritating noise go away. That if they learn in their head to just make that noise, to, to have their own on purpose buzz, because remember the trick is always, you wanna take control of something, you take the buzz and you make it louder. So it's worse, right? Because if you can make it louder, you can make it less loud. And uh, you know that's the other approach. I find that tedious. So I try to find a note to harmonize with it. And I have them make that note somewhere in their head and hear it and hear it get loud. And then I have them put it with the tinnitus note 
and have it harmonize. And when it resonates, it has a tendency to disappear, especially if you put them in a deep trance and you tell them that it's going to and set up figure signals and get their unconscious to agree to do it. And, and if it returns, the harmony note returns and it disappears again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for being here. As uh, I said at the beginning, for the people that joined uh, in the middle, you're going to receive the, the five uh, webinars that Dr. Bandler did with the trainers asking, uh, he responding their questions based on his new book, um, Legacy of the Master. So next week, you're going to receive an email with all of those links and some links of the other books that are, again, out so you can um, enjoy them. Thank you very much. Have a great day and a great night, great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you all for coming.